Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. It is the Holy Week. I'm sure you're all fasting, not eating, doing holy things, cutting out TV. Just kidding. Jess and I started a brand new series last night. I won't tell you what it is because as a pastor, I no longer suggest TV shows to anybody because I don't want to ruin anybody's witness. (laughs) Um, I'm excited about this message this morning. There are a number of reasons for that. But first, um, more than anything, I want you to know that our church is a church that prays. Our church is not a church that puts prayer on the side. Our church is not a church that um, sometimes beseeches the Almighty for the work that we do or what we're asking of Him, but we're a church that prays. And tonight at 5 p.m. at the farm, we will be praying together um, in Burgaw. On Pinckney Road, um, you'll see us there. Tonight, we will pray. And here's the thing about prayer. I didn't used to pray very much. Even when I was in the midst of youth ministry, doing all kinds of stuff, you know why I didn't pray? Because it didn't work. Who likes to pray and say things to God and nothing happens? You guys like that? You like to just yammer on about stuff and God doesn't do anything? Like, that's my favorite kind of prayer. God, please heal me, but I really hope you don't. Nobody's actually thinking that. We are about effective prayer. So tonight as we pray, we're going to pray God's will. We're going to pray what he's asking first, and we're going to pray together um, for the transformation, not just of our church, but of this entire city. Does anyone believe that? Here's the thing. A lot of us are so arrogant in our lifestyle that we don't ask God for help. We say to the Almighty, we say to the one who created the universe with his words, actually, you know what, God, I've got this one. And a lot of times we think the small things don't matter as much. But every single detail of my life and every single detail of your life, God can do better than you. Did you know that? God is an expert at everything you do, but beyond what you do. He can assist you in what you do, and he can bring miracles in what you do. We believe God still works in power. He still heals, he still moves, he still pours himself out on people, and don't we know that this nation, not just Wilmington, this nation needs revival? Stand up for a second, y'all are bothering me. If you're holding a baby, that's fine. How you worship and how you pray And we're going to teach you how to pray this morning, and I'll just give you a quick beginning of the Lord's Prayer, okay? Because it all starts with worship. It all starts with putting God in his proper place, not your problems magnified, not your issues magnified, not your wounding magnified, but God Almighty, our Father in heaven, magnified above everything else. So I want you to just lift your hands. This is really simple. Lift your hands. You're going to repeat after me, and then I'm going to give you some instructions. Our Father... Hallowed be thy name. name. Say it again. Our Father. Father. Hallowed be thy name. name. Now this is what I want you to do. Keep your hands up. This is going to be uncomfortable for some of you. Right? If you came from a Baptist church, I'm really sorry. (laughs) I'm actually not sorry. (laughs) This is a sign of surrender to God. Your will to his will. He's greater than you. That's why we lift our hands in church when we worship. We put our hands together in celebration when we clap. We start with worship. We start with putting God in his proper place. So this is what I want you to do, and it can be simple, and it can be repetitive at first, too. Just tell God how great he is and what he's done in your life. Just tell him how great he is and what he's done in your life. Has he given you a family? Has he given you a roof over your head? Has he given you healthy children? Has he given you a job? Has he given you food in your belly this morning, a car that works? What has he given you today? What what has the Almighty done that is so small and insignificant to him, but he's blessed you anyways? How good and gracious and powerful he is. Is he your Savior this morning? Is he the one that sent his Son on your behalf? If anything, thank him for your salvation. And if you're not saved yet, you'll be thanking him by the end of this service. But right now, thank him for what he's given you. 
Before anything else, worship is a sign of gratitude to him. Come on, lift up your voices this morning. Don't give up after five seconds. These people are coming for your kids. They're bringing ideologies to rip them away from you, and you don't pray? Let's pray this morning. Lift up your hands and pray this morning. Thank God for his breakthrough in your life today. We thank you, Father, who's in heaven, seated on high above all things, in majesty above all things. God, you are beyond time and space. You made time and space themselves. You made the breath in our lungs. God, we exalt you above everything. You're holy. You're something completely different than we are. And we bless you this morning, Lord. We bless you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Now go home and do that with your family. Amen. Go home and do that with your family. There was one more thing I needed to mention. Good Friday. Coming up this Friday is also at the farm. It's going to be a fun, wild night. Come ready to get baptized. Come ready to worship. We're going to take communion together. And we are going to thank Jesus for what he did for us on the cross. That's where the victory is. You guys know that, right? Every victory in you, your life that you need, every victory that you need, maybe not what you want, but every victory that you need is on the cross. Amen? So this Friday at the farm, under the tent, we're going to have a wild time, so come ready. It's going to be tons and tons of fun. This is our whole weekend. Obviously, we have Easter. We celebrate Easter as a church because we're not heretics. And then we'll have an egg hunt right after, right out the back of the church um, for all the kids. It's going to be lots of fun. And we're not one of those churches that, like, limits eggs, okay? So we're going to hop your kids up on sugar, right? They grab as many as they want, right? And parents with toddlers, help them out. Fill that basket. Get all the Reese's eggs. How not it funny that, like, the Reese's, like, the eggs are better than the regular ones? Anybody else with me on that? No, I'm like, I stock up on those things. They're so much better than the regular ones. I don't know why. It's like the perfect mixture of chocolate and peanut butter. Anyways, that has nothing to do with my message. I bet I could work it in, though. All right. All right, and, and prayer and feasting. So we're going to have a barbecue at the farm at 430 and pray directly after. Like we said, every single week at 5 p.m., Sunday evenings, whether Jess or I are traveling, but we'll be there every single time we are in town, which is most of the time, we will be praying together. And we've seen so many amazing things already take place there. It's been unreal. By the way, Rick, great offering message. Where'd you go? Oh, he went to the restroom. <laughs> I keep encouraging people after they've left the room today. But anyways, give Rick, give Rick some encouragement today, right? And his little Benny Hinn, he went on the host today, giving him instruction. That was funny to me. Have you ever seen Benny Hinn in a service, if you guys know who that is? He's like the super charismatic minister. He just yells at people. He's like, don't do that. Do this. And you're like, okay, <laughs> sorry. All right. The triumphal entry. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much. That you are not necessarily the Savior that we wanted, but the Savior we need. This morning we bless you. Lord, I thank you that you would put your words in my mouth, that I would speak on your behalf this morning, that I would be a messenger for you this morning. Lord, bless this message and may it impact and change every single person here. In Jesus' name. Luke 19 and verse 28 is where we're going to start, but first... Let me talk about something real quick. Every single person here has expectations, right? You have expectations in life, general expectations in life. You have expectations of your wife or your husband, right? I remember sitting down in premarital counseling. One of the, my parents did our premarital counseling. Awkward for anybody, <laughs> right? And out of my mother's mouth comes, how often are you guys going to have sex each week? I was like, okay. This will be another counseling session with different people. I am super uncomfortable with this right now. But to answer your question, at least 11 times a week. We have crazy expectations going into things, right? Unless you have kids and you're like, oh, 11 is probably too much, babe. We need to knock it down to just seven times, right? But I think for all of us, we have lots of expectations in our life. We go into things in our head 
think about it this. Texting is a good, good one. Who here is a fast text responder? Right? You're a fast text responder. You're on top of it. Man's running a business back there. He's got to get back. I am not. And everyone on our team will know that. Give me 24 hours, right, for the most part. My phone exists for my convenience and not for yours. A lot of people need to realize that about cell phones. You're texting me at 11 o'clock at night. You're not going to get a response, and you might get some agitation and just ignore you for the first part of the morning just because I'm like, who texts at 11 o'clock at night? can't believe it. Like if you're having an affair or something, definitely text at 11 o'clock at night. We need to talk. Uh, But that being said, everyone has different expectations, even when it comes to communication. You have expectations when it comes to your home. How clean it should be. Should the bed be fixed? What should people wear around the house? Some houses are shoes on houses. Some houses are shoes off houses. But both, especially shoes off people, I find are more like Nazi-ish. You know what I mean? Would you agree with me? Get those shoes off. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Let's just chill out a little bit here. But everyone has different expectations when it comes to their life. Some of you have had real heartfelt expectations in your life. You should have met the one by now. Right? Maybe you didn't expect to have a miscarriage. Maybe you expected not to be broke. Maybe you expected the job to work out, work there for 30 years, retire. Maybe you expected your pastors or leaders to treat you a certain way. Maybe you expected your parents to raise you a certain way. One of the root issues that we have for the most part is we all expected our fathers to be something for us, didn't we? And how many of your fathers were perfect? Nope. Whether it's present but not present, we're totally not there at all. Every single one of us had an expectation set. And we look back to that expectation and we feel let down. How often do human beings let you down? Right? It's, it's hard. It's hard, too, especially as a minister, right? So there's a stat out there. Most people in their lifetime lose seven core friendships. A pastor loses seven a year. Because they're associated with an organization. It's like, well, it's just a church. I'll just go. It's like, wait, but we're also human beings. And people let you down and you just charge on. You're called to it. It's part of the gig. That's fine. I'm not complaining. But it's hard for most of us in the world we live in today to not be cynical. The media lies to us. Amen. Amen. Yeah, come on. Is this an American church or what? That mainstream media. Let's get mad together. All right? (laughs) All the politicians lie to you? Come on, I'm trying to stir it up a little bit, right? Your children lie to you? No, I'm just kidding. They do. You don't have to even teach them. It's wild. But I think for the most part, we've grown cynical. People have grown cynical. And that transfers over into our relationship with Jesus. Because the place where we become the most cynical by far is in our relationships with other people. The expectation gets built over time that you're going to be let down. And that's where most of the pain in our life, too. It's where most of the glory is, too. Most of the good stuff in our life is in relationship, but nobody is ever perfect. And many times, people don't meet our expectations. And a lot of times, it's because we haven't met our own. Everyone knows you have a relationship with yourself, right? That voice that bounces around in your head all day long, you have this internal voice. If you don't have an internal dialogue, you have a psychiatric issue and you need to talk to somebody, right? But everybody's got an internal dialogue, the stuff you think all the time. And a lot of times, sometimes the truth comes up and it doesn't come out of your mouth because you're trying to be polite, right? All those things. There's an internal dialogue happening all the time. And you make promises to yourself, don't you? Everyone does that, right? Like you write down your goals for the year, right? It's almost the end of March, guys. It's not January anymore. How's that consistency going? You reading through your Bible this year for the first time? (laughs) That's one of the funniest ones to me. I'm going to read through the Bible this year. How many times have you tried? Just need to do it every day. (laughs) Just every day. Let's start there. But we make those promises and we even break those promises to ourselves. 
We set expectations on ourselves, and then we miss those expe expectations many times because we're imperfect, and we get angry and bitter at the people around us because we haven't met our own expectations for ourselves. We haven't met the expectations of our internal dialogue. I know that when I'm like cantankerous, you guys like that word, cantankerous? I thought that was a good choice. I'm pulling out the thesaurus this morning. When I get like that, I know that I've set expectations for myself that I haven't met. I haven't kept promises to myself that I need to keep. And I start making sure everyone around me keeps their promises to me. To fill that little hole of me failing. Anyone else feel that? You know what I'm talking about. When you're just horrible to be around. You're like, it's you. It's someone else. It's definitely external. It's like, no, you made a promise not to keep doing that habit. You made a promise to just even as simple as exercise. You made a promise to be in your secret place on a daily basis. You made a promise to be more loving to your wife. You made that internal promise, and you're not meeting that internal promise, so you start to judge other people for things that you're already good at. That's called Phariseeism. Right? Well, we're going to avoid this part back here because... I haven't been able to exercise all year, but we are going to talk about something completely different. Well, I read my Bible every day. I can't believe you don't read your Bible every day. That's unbelievable. That's called Phariseeism, right? Yeah. Beep up. There is an expectation on Jesus, and everyone needs to realize there was a huge expectation on Jesus. Let me set the context for you in the ancient Near East in Jerusalem at this time. There's a huge expectation on Jesus. Even his disciples are setting an expectation on him. And it's called an ex eschatolo esch eschatological expectation. I got it. I did it. Eschatological. <laughs> I was trying to sound smart. <laughs> the end times, right? When the Jews were going to believe the end of days was coming and the Messiah was going to usher in a brand new era. And what that era looked like was a certain expectation in their head. A Davidic king who would take over and rule from Jerusalem the entire world. That's a pretty big expectation, wouldn't you say? So what happens on this day? So what you guys need to realize is that Jesus actually enters through the eastern gate. And that's a really important thing to, to note. Jesus enters through the eastern gate. That's where they would take the Passover lamb and lead it up to the Temple Mount. So Jesus is entering Jerusalem on the Passover, and there's a frenzy when he enters because they're expecting this man, remember what happened just a week before. Why are they so crazy? A week before, Jesus raised someone from the dead. How good of an army would you have if none of your soldiers ever died? Think about it. That's what these Jews are thinking. They're thinking, even if someone cuts my noggin off, Jesus is going to come right by because he's the Messiah, pluck that sucker back on, and I'm going to get back up and kill more Romans. Like, you're getting pumped. Like, let's get rid of these guys because this guy obviously has the power of life and death in his hands. He can raise people from the dead. Is there a better king or a better, better general that you could possibly think of to go to war with? Right? It's kind of like playing murder in the dark and Jesus is the nurse. Right? No one played murder in the dark. It's kind of like mafia. You sneak around in the dark in your house and you get tapped on the shoulder and someone's going around saying, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And there's a nurse that goes around and like raises people from the dead. Jesus is like that guy in the house. Right? He's going around raising people from the dead. And so there's this huge expectation. Like obviously this is a sign that he's the king and maybe even God. And they think he's going to enter through this eastern gate and remove the Romans. You have to remember that the Antonio Fortress, the fortress where the Romans oversaw the temple and oversaw Jerusalem, was only three football fields away from where Jesus entered. Jerusalem's not that big, but it's packed. They would say on Passover at times, at this period, almost a quarter million lambs would be slaughtered. Can you imagine? That's some barbecue. Right? That's a lot going on. A quarter million lambs being slaughtered at Passover. Jerusalem could swell up to a million people. So it would be as big as the capital of the Roman Empire. And you got to think about this. Like, they're not flushing the toilets. Right? It's packed. It's insane. Everyone's in a religious fervor. 
right? They've been under Roman oppression for, for a long time, and they're over it. They're paying taxes they don't want to pay, right? Friends and family are disappearing sometimes. They're under the foot of a tyrant. So why wouldn't God send a Messiah to remove them now? He's done it before. The expectation is the removal of the Romans added to religious fervor of the Passover. Do you guys remember what happened at Passover, what God did at the Passover? He killed the firstborn of their enemies, all of them, including their cattle. The angel of death was very thorough. So they're thinking, it's Passover week. The angel of death is coming on our behalf, and he's going to wipe out these Romans with the Messiah at the front. And who could it be but this guy that just rose Lazarus from the dead? You could imagine walking into town, and people would know Lazarus. He was up the street at Bethany, right? One day's walk. There would be people in Jerusalem. They're like, yeah, I heard. Yeah, Jesus is coming. Yeah, oh, I heard about it. I was actually there, and I know Lazarus. Like, I do business with, La- with Lazarus. Like my cousin saw it. My cousin was there. Like, people are talking about it, right? You know how news travels, right? He was dead for three days. It wasn't like a leg growing out on YouTube or like some, like, minor headache going away. Someone was dead for three days and stinky. Jesus raises him from the dead. Do you think if I go out tomorrow, and obviously I'm not Jesus, but if I go out tomorrow and raise someone from the dead in a morgue that's been there for a week, like, word might get around. Right? And then expectations would change. Do you agree? Yeah. Like people bringing dead bodies in here and stuff. And I look forward to the day. I hope it happens. But the reality for Jesus is he's walking into a scenario where every single person in that crowd, including his disciples, are expecting something different than what he's going to do. Right. And we do the same thing to him. Luke 19, verse 28, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Then he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, the Mount of Olives. He sent two of the disciples, saying, go into the village in front of you, where you are entering, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. (laughs) I always find this part hilarious. I don't know if Jesus went in front of him, knew the guy that had the colt, but imagine, that, that's nerve-wracking. I'm going to go and steal somebody's car. That's basically what they're doing. Like Jesus says, you're his disciple, and Jesus is like, all right, so what I want you to do is go into this guy's garage early in the morning, start it up, and just drive off. And if he asks you <laughs> what you're doing with that, just say, the Lord has need of it, brother. Guys, pay attention to this stuff in the Bible. Like, he, they just take it. And it happened just like that. Verse 33, and as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And I don't know if the conversation kept going or not, but either they got out of there quickly or the people were like, this is so weird, it's got to be God. Anyone ever have situations like that before? It's like, this is so strange that it has to be the Lord doing this. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Really quickly, as they spread their cloaks on the road, the Jewish garment would have the word or prayer around their neck, their prayer shawl, the four corners. So as they're throwing down their cloaks, they're throwing down their prayers in front of him, their hopes their expectations. They're very garments that they're throwing down in front of Jesus and that he's sitting on, his disciples' garments. It's saying, this is what I've prayed for my whole life. This is all I've ever wanted was to see the Messiah with my own eyes. I want my kids to live free, not under Roman oppression. That's a legitimate hope, wouldn't you say? And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
where they were saying Hosanna, which means save now. In John, he says, it says Hosanna, and it means save now. So they're saying as he's walking in, they're praising him, and they're saying, save us now. Save us now. Do it now. Now is the time. They're putting the pressure on him with praise. Anyone else ever receive pressure with praise? You know you do. Anyone been in church before? <laughs> That's what it is. You receive pressure with praise. Jesus is the man on fire right now. Everybody's talking about him. Everybody's trying to make him famous. Everybody's trying to make him king. And they're laying everything out in front of him saying, you're the king, you're the king, you're the king, you're the king. And worshiping him. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And that is one BA way of saying you're God. They say, hey, stop these guys. They're worshiping you. Stop it. You have to stop them. And he says, look, if everyone was silent on this whole earth, these stones would worship me. So he's not saying I'm not the king. But what kind of king do we have here? He rides in on a donkey, which is, and a lot of people think that Pontius Pilate came in to govern that same day because the city gets so crazy he needed to be in the city with extra troops. He would come in pompously on a horse, on a battle charger, giant horse. Jesus comes in on a little donkey that's never been ridden before. You think they'd start getting the hint. It's obviously prophesied in Zechariah. He's fulfilling this prophecy on purpose. Behold, your king comes to you on a donkey's colt, right? He comes through the east gate where they lead the procession of the first sacrificial lamb. They choose it the week before. So this is the crazy thing. During the week, they're choosing the lamb. I'll let you put those pieces together yourself. They're choosing him as their sacrificial lamb, but they don't know how they're going to do it. Because this is the same crowd four days later that says, give us Barabbas. And they sacrifice the lamb themselves. What does he do once he gets there? And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you or an embankment around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. This happened in AD 70. General Titus of the Roman Empire built up embankments around the entire city. They slaughtered almost everyone in the city. And Jesus says something very interesting. And tear you down to the ground and your children within you and, you will not, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you. I went to the temple in Jerusalem. There was so much gold in the temple that when it was on fire and the gold melted, it got in between the cracks on the stones. So the Romans put every stone on the ground. Every stone except for the retaining wall, which didn't have any gold on it. But every single stone of the temple, they peeled off to get the gold from the inside because the fire was so hot. You did not know, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. This is a really interesting word, visitation. It means almost like your superintendence or he's coming to check in on them. You didn't realize the time I came to check in on you. You didn't see. Jesus has a list in front of him and he's coming to see, will they receive me as their God? God has already sent prophets, prophets, prophets. They've sawed them in half. They've burned them to death. They've let them starve to death. They'd stone them to death. He's like, maybe they'll respect my son. You guys know the parable, right? And he says, you know, you did not know the time of your visitation. This is when God himself, the presence of God comes down. And one crazy thing about the Eastern Gate as well that Jesus enters through is that's where the Shekinah glory, the glory of God, the presence of God would rest in Jerusalem. The very presence of God in human form is walking through that gate. And they do not recognize it when they see it. How many times in our life and how many times have we set an expectation on Jesus himself? 
to be a certain kind of king to us. So many times we set an expectation on Jesus to be a king on our terms. God, do justice on my behalf. Forgive them. God, I hate this person. Love them. God, I need you to take care of my finances. I need you to take care of my expenses. Give your money away. He does the opposite of everything we would want him or expect him to do in so many circumstances because Jesus plays on his own terms. If he's going to be the king that we need, he can't be the king that you want. Do you see what kind of king the world wants, right? The kind of king that fixes all their problems. The kind of king that treats them like children. The kind of king that gives them handouts. The kind of king that solves the things in their life that they don't have the responsibility themselves to solve. That's the kind of king the world wants. The kind of king Jesus is, is the kind of king that makes you a king and a queen yourself. He says, I expect the same out of you that I showed you on my way to the cross. What you need to realize about Jesus is right before this, it says he set his eyes on Jerusalem, which, it, which means he set his eyes on the mission before him. Too many of us are so distracted with the little things in life and all the stuff we want to accumulate and all the people we want to accumulate and all our dreams and visions that we have for ourselves that we don't set our eyes on Christ. There's one thing that matters in the end, and it's the king. And these people are kind of realizing it, but they're missing the point. Why? You see what Jesus does next. This is so, he, he's trying to get killed. I, I want to make that really, really clear for you guys. Jesus was not murdered. Whenever you hear anybody in some church say Jesus was murdered by an oppressive authority, he was not. He gave his life of his own will. Otherwise, his sacrifice means nothing. He used the authority structures that were in place in order to bring a sacrifice on our behalf. He cleanses the temple next. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house. He says, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers or a den of thieves. And this is what he does next. This is the most baller thing ever, right? Jesus cleanses the temple. This is the, Luke, the version in Luke. Jesus cleanses the temple. What do you normally do when you've gotten too angry and done something that you wish you wouldn't have done? You get out of there. Right? You get quiet. You say sorry. You back away. You're like, look, I made, like, I know. I was frustrated the other day. I was just a little hungry. Things were, like, a little crazy. I know I snapped on you, and I made everybody cry, and I changed the whole atmosphere of our house. But here's the thing. I'm just really sorry. What does Jesus do when he goes apoplectic, when he's angry, livid with what the temple looks like? He sits down and begins to teach. He's like, this is my space now. Thank you very much. <laughs> you have to understand the human component of this. A lot of people, oh, well, Jesus sat down and teach. That's a cool little scripture. No, everyone's like, Ooh. like there's guards, there's soldiers around, there's people that are offended, people that have lost their businesses because Jesus cleansed them out of the temple. And he takes the space where they should have been praying and begins to teach them. And he was teaching daily in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes, and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. So they're trying to kill him. They're listening to the teaching, right? But they're trying to kill him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. All these people are waiting for Jesus to say, okay, now's the time, guys. Grab your swords. Let's go. Let's get rid of these Romans. We outnumber them right now. There's at least a million of us in this city. That means there's probably 200,000 able-bodied men in the city versus, versus maybe one or two legions, which is 10,000 men. We could do it now, Jesus. Now's the time. You just raised someone from the dead. Get rid of them. We can fortify the city. Let's do this. Let's get rid of this oppression, Jesus. This is the king we want. You multiply bread, even if they bring a siege and put embankments against the wall. All you have to do is multiply loaves and fishes. We could stay in here indefinitely and starve them out. Think about that kind of thought process that's going through their brain, if you're a practical person. That's what they're thinking. But what does Jesus do? He begins to teach in the temple. He gives final instructions 
to his disciples, and he has a Passover meal with them, what we call the Last Supper. And he says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Can you imagine them sitting there that night with all the expectation in their heart of judging the 12 tribes of Israel? Because that's what he told his disciples they would do. Like, cool, you're going to set up your kingdom, and I'm going to be a judge. I'm, this is our guy. This is our guy. Like every single day, like they're with Jesus. They've been with Jesus for three years. The disciples are like, this is our guy. This is our guy every single day. Look how popular he is, right? He's so popular. He's doing miracles. He's the best teacher, the best preacher you've ever seen. That's my pastor. That's my pastor. That's my pastor, right, all day long. And then the soldiers come and arrest him, and they're like, that's not my guy. We do the same thing. Christianity, real Christianity, ain't super popular right now. I don't know if you've noticed. You can talk it all you want. You can be a hearer of the word. You can go to church. But if you actually do what the Bible tells you to do, you're swimming upstream and you will be unpopular with Jesus. Jesus says, I mean, with Jesus as in alongside him. Because Jesus says the world will hate you. It hates me. Of course it's going to hate you. Because you're doing everything opposite of what the world believes. See, our expectation on Jesus so many times in our prayers, our expectation on Jesus is to be a certain type of king for us. But this is an age right now before he comes in judgment where he tells us to live like he lived, to serve like he served, to die like he died, to carry our cross on a daily basis, to love like he loved. To, to preach a gospel of repentance so people turn from this wicked generation. That's not popular. It's not a popular message, but it's the only message that works. The real message of Jesus, the real message of Jesus is you don't understand the problem. Let me give you a metaphor for this really quickly. So we have hurricanes here. That's a new thing for me. I used to live in a place where there are earthquakes. Before that, just crime. New York, California, <laughs> and now coastal North Carolina. So we got hurricanes here. Imagine, imagine a Cat 5 comes through Wilmington and obliterates your house, floods your house. Like you go to the hotel in Charlotte, whatever you got to do, let's just say your family's safe, okay? You do whatever you got to do. But your house is completely obliterated. You come back. You got the insurance paper sorted. You got all that stuff. You got the homeowner's insurance. You're like, okay, everything's going to be fine. Da, 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 da. You're thinking about it. And, the, and you come to your house, and your house is completely tilted. The foundation gets washed out underneath. Like everything's wrong with it, right? You walk in with a contractor that your insurance company hired who's probably like the best 6 out of 10 contractor, but he's going to do a decent job. You walk in the front door. You look around, and there's just mud and debris everywhere. Everything that you had before, all these little possessions that you accumulated, they're gone. They're washed away by one storm. And you look around, and you go, you know what this place needs? It needs a big screen TV <laughs> and a couch. That's all. If, as long as I have a big screen TV and a couch... Everything's fine. The contractor is looking at you like your, your whole, this has to be torn down and completely rebuilt from the foundation. We're going to have to pour new concrete. You might be able to pump it up from underneath, but likely we'll have to tear the concrete out and put a whole new foundation in and start from scratch. This house is gone. Do you realize that? It's like, ah, you know what? I just really love. Let me ask the Lord. Lord, please bless me with a couch and a big screen TV, and God from heaven is going, brother, you need a house. Too many times in our life we ask for the peripheral things when the problem is our sin and we need to repent. All the crazy ideologies you see floating around right now, all many of the problems relationally and others in your life right now are because we're sinful. You don't need the couch and the TV. You don't need a better job until you figure out how to stop being sinful with your money now. You don't need that wife 
in your life or that husband in your life until you learn how to love properly and prepare for the type of person that you want. Remove the sin from your life. Chase after God. Chase the kingdom. Be one-eyed about it. Focus your eyes on Jerusalem like Jesus did. Look, and we don't look at Jerusalem. We look at Jesus. But we look at him. So many times we're walking into a house that's been obliterated, our lives sometimes. And we say, we ask for the wrong things. Like, God, please rebuild the whole thing from the ground up. And that's what Jesus was doing. They thought they needed a king to get rid of the Romans. What they needed was a king to save them from hell. What they needed was a king that would save them for eternity. What they needed was a king that would reign from heaven, intercede on their behalf, and see something really change in their lives. How does something really change, though? I mean, all of us try and change, right? And if we submit to Jesus, right, I can say that all day long. We can submit to Jesus. One thing has to replace another. That's how change really happens. It's displacement. It's always displacement. If you want to change a habit, little hot tip for all of you, remove something and put something else in its place. That's the only way that it actually works. You can't do partial. You can't do half of it. That's why when Jesus tells us to come and die, follow him, Right? Take up your cross and follow him. He's not saying, I want this part of you, but you can keep the rest. I want this part of you, but you hold on to that. What Jesus is explicitly saying when he goes to the cross himself, he says, I want you to follow me in this so that you can die with me and raise with me and be with me in my resurrection through baptism. Jesus is asking us for all of it. Your problem is not the peripheral. The problem is everything. (laughs) Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a total teardown rebuild. That's what salvation is. Salvation is not adding Jesus to your life. He's not just the door. Jesus is saying when he goes to the cross and when he walks through that gate, when he's sitting on the donkey, when he cleanses the temple, when he goes up the mountain, when he sits with his disciples and he's breaking bread with them and saying, this is my body and this is my blood. And I know you all are going to betray me, but don't worry, I'll be back. Some of us in this room have been believers for a long time and we begin to give parts of ourselves to the world and to the flesh. And we're wondering what's going on when Jesus is saying, I just need all of you. Please, just give me all of you. I want to give you life and life more abundantly. I want to give you eternal life. I want you to be satisfied and refreshed. I want you to be joyful. I want you to be full of joy despite the circumstances. I want you to have that joy in the midst of suffering. How crazy would that be? How crazy would it be if we had a church that lost its cynicism and believed Jesus? Just read the word and said, he said it, I believe it. He said it, I believe it. What if you had faith for your life like that? The things in your life that are going wrong are not necessarily the things that you think they are. You have bad fruit from a tree. The tree needs to be cut down and replaced with the tree of life. You know, the other crazy part about Jesus' entrance into the eastern gate of Jerusalem is that's where God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, out of the eastern side of the garden. And that's where the cherubim stands to keep us from accessing the tree of life. But the man that gave us the tree of life, the cross, again enters through the eastern gate, the only man who could re-enter the garden. And you know the temple itself was a, was a shadow of the Garden of Eden and heaven itself. And when he goes in the temple and cleanses it, he's removing that evil himself. It's a foreshadowing clue of what he's going to do when he gets on the cross and defeats death. He's given us access again to the tree of life. See, that's what a lot of people don't get to. Yes, there's repentance. Yes, you need to turn. Yes, it's a teardown rebuild. But the reality of it is you will have nothing if you don't have him. And our expectations of him need to change. If someone's going to save you from certain death, you don't Give them terms. I mean, let's make it practical, guys. Your house is burning down. Your kids are upstairs. You can't access them. It's hot. Someone comes in, a fireman, comes equipped. 
right? To walk through the heat, tear down a door, and rescue your children. It's like, wait, wait, wait. Like, I need you to grab a couple of things first before you get in there. They're super valuable to me. I'm not really sure. Like, do this first. And, like, when you get in there, take off your shoes if you could. I don't want you to get too much dirt on the floor. No, there's no terms or conditions when your life is being saved. You receive and get saved. And the king of heaven and earth has decided to save you. And some of you in this room today, in this very room today, aren't here by accident. And you need that tear down rebuild. You need to change your expectations on Jesus. So God, why don't you answer my prayers on this and this and this? He's like, I want you first to be saved. I want you first to know who I am. I want you first to look me in the eyes. I want you first to know me. I want you first to know that I can give you life and life more abundantly because many times the things that we pray for in the end turn sour because we ask for them for our own benefit. To pump ourselves up, to give ourselves ego, to strengthen ourselves, to make us look better. And Jesus is saying, please die and you'll have life. I beg you, let me show you how. That's the beautiful thing about our king. A lot of religious leaders ask people to do things without doing them themselves. Jesus says, let me show you. Let me show you how to die. And let me show you there's life in it as well. That's the beginning of the message of Easter. And it's not just once a year. We have access all year long to that resurrection power. We have access all year long to this king who doesn't just defeat dictators or remove people. He still judges nations. Of course he does. God actively judges. But the type of king you need is a king that saves you from yourself. It may not be what you want all the time, but it's exactly what you need. Let's stand. If you're here this morning and you've prayed to God before, maybe you've sought him, you've looked for him to bail you out of certain situations, and he does. Often, I've found more often than not, God answers prayers if we're persistent like he says. He does. That's why we're praying tonight as a church. But if you're in here this morning, if you're a Christian that's been giving pieces of your life away to the world and to the flesh... What that means is your own desires. And you, all, you can always tell when you're doing that because it makes you feel sour. It brings a cloud into your life. It brings depression, anxiety, frustration, all those types of emotional responses to giving yourself away to the desires of this world. If that's you and you haven't done the whole thing, whole kit and caboodle and said, look, Jesus, I accept you as king on no terms whatsoever but on your terms alone. That's how you get life. That's the benefit of this type of king. If that's you in here this morning, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to repent. I want the ministry team that's here to come forward to get ready to pray for people. But if you've never received Jesus before, and this is what I mean by that, if you've never said, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to save me from the sin that I have in my life. I want you to redeem me. I want that life and life more abundantly. And I know my own religion, because everybody has a religion, my own habits aren't working. And I need saving. It takes some humility. It does. That's why the cross is an offense, because you have to say, I can't do it. You just have to throw your hands up, surrender, and say, I can't do it. I can't do this, God. I can't do it on my own, first of all. And I can't do it the way I'm doing it anymore. I can't have this addiction anymore. I can't walk away from God anymore. I can't do this anymore the way that I want to do it. If that's you in here this morning, you're either of those people, I just want you to put both hands up in the air this morning. And I'll start. I'll start as your pastor. I know I have things to repent of. Or I haven't died yet. Everybody does. But he's asking for the whole thing. 
I know I have expectations that I put on people that are unfair. My wife, my children, the people that I lead in this church that are not from God necessarily, but from me and my own frustration. I know I've done that. Anybody want to join me in repenting this morning and just give everything to Jesus? Certainly can't hurt. So, Lord, I thank you for everyone that's had the courage to put their hands up this morning and surrender to you. God, bless them with an overwhelming sense of your spirit right now, sanctifying them, transforming them, Lord Jesus. And again, saving them. You're not just our Savior once, but you save us all the time. (laughs) So, God, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for being saved and continuing to be saved. In Jesus' name, Jess. We're going to continue to minister, but can we just give a hand to Parker for that word this morning? And I just pray that as we go through the week, we're just meditating on that revelation because I think we can do the same thing, right? We can praise God one moment and then put all our blame on him for why things are not working out, not realizing that sometimes we've crucified him ourselves and not paid attention that he's the resurrected king and so I think it's really important we put Jesus in his proper place in our lives he likes to be the Lord of all so um, I just actually I'm going to change something with our ministry team from here on out until the Lord says otherwise so hooray (laughs) Um, so we're actually not going to have the ministry team come to the front anymore as I was praying in the back um, the Lord said that This is a prophetic church. It's a prophetic community. And so as a prophetic people, you know, Jesus tells his disciples what ministry is, is to meet the needs of the people. And the disciples went out in Matthew 10. We see that they went out. They healed the sick. They cast out demons. They raised the dead. And I want to encourage you, if you gave your life to Jesus this morning, I want you to come forward because in your life, there actually needs to be that line in the sand moment. And I think moving your physical body, saying, I'm no longer living for myself, but I'm actually going to enter into a brand new life and get baptized. But some of you who gave your life to Jesus today for the first real time, you actually need to come in the front and not have anyone pray for you. You need to just come before the Lord and draw that line in the sand. Come forward, just get on your knees. We're gonna have Rick just play for a moment. But you just need to get on your knees and say, forgive me, Father, heal me, heal my heart, heal my mind, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And just right now, just come and lay your life before the Lord and then be baptized today, not tomorrow, not Friday, but be baptized today so that you can live a brand new life. Right, so if that's you, we're gonna have you do that. And then I'm gonna have the ministry team actually ask the Holy Spirit as anointed ministry team leaders, who needs a need met, right? Because here's what Jesus did. My favorite verse is, it says he went into the crowds. He went and met the people, right? He went to the pools and he went to the cities and he went to the towns and he went to where the prostitutes were, right? And he met those that were in dark places. And here's the problem with the American church. We sit and we want to see the dunamis power, but we don't go out and do the thing. Right, we're waiting for people to come to us. Listen, people that are hungry, that are desperate for a miracle, likely they're not gonna come to you because the demonic voices in their head are saying that they're unworthy. They, they can't even recognize that the tormenting thoughts are not their own, right? So as a prophetic people, this is a church that's filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you don't know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, we wanna pray for you because you're supposed to hear from God so you can go into Wilmington and you can lay hands on the sick and see them recovered in Jesus' name. So ministry team, you can go out right now and start to pray for people, but I'm just gonna start to highlight some people. So Shane and Seth and Avi, can you guys come here for a second? Shane, Seth and Avi, come to this wall over here. And I wanna start demonstrating to you in this building what's gonna start happening in Wilmington. 
God is going to start linking arms with you guys as missionary teams into the region, right? And so I'm taking this missionary team right now, and you guys are going to come over here. And then can I grab you for a second? So the Lord has said that today is your commissioning day. And you don't have to do the thing alone. And I feel like there's been a burden and a heavy weight that you've been carrying. And the Lord says that he's called you and anointed you to be in ministry. And I just believe that this, these men need to father you. You don't need just discipleship. You need men that are coming alongside you. So guys, can you just surround him? Can you prophesy over him? Can you pray over him? Because we just break every lie from the enemy on your life. We bind loneliness in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, if you know for a fact that you have been given the gift of healing, can you just come over here right now? So if you're like, I know I have the gift of healing. Okay, come right over here. Really quick, the Lord has said to you that you are a good father. I was walking the back and I saw the Lord highlight over you that you are a good, good, good father. And is this your son? Your son has the gift of healing. And so can you just open up your hands like this? Come over here. Caleb, can you pray for him? But just release healing power over him. You are gonna lay hands on sick people and see them heal. Do you believe that? You have a healing anointing on your life. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for this mighty man of God. And we just thank you, Lord, that you have consecrated him. You have anointed him. And so we activate right now through the power of the Holy Spirit, the healing anointing on his life and all lies from the enemy. We break off of you now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So can you guys just continue to pray for them? as a family. And if you see someone around you that needs prayer, you can just begin to pray for them. And Oliver, the Lord says that he has called you to be an evangelist and he has called you to go into the highways and the byways to preach the good news. And he says, don't overcomplicate it. Keep it simple. Do the simple things and you will see with your own two eyes the power of God. And so he says right now, just lift up your eyes. The fields are white with harvest. So we thank you for all of our Lord Jesus and we pray that you anoint him, that you, we thank you for the boldness on his life, Holy Spirit. And I thank you that his voice will go into the highways, into the byways and call your children home. And so we thank you for the cry of the evangelist that says, come home, the gospel is real, the gospel is good news. It is better news than you could ever imagine. And so we just ask Holy Spirit that you anoint his lips, you anoint his words, increase the boldness and the hunger in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, thank you, Jesus. Okay, just everyone just begin to pray in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you, God, that you're here, you're in our midst. There is no one like you, God. The deception of Satan is making Jesus too familiar. Satan himself thought that he was like God. There is no one like God. He is the lamb slain before the beginnings of the world for our sins. No one else can take away sin. Behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. If you are struggling, with a sin that you are trying to combat in your own strength and you feel like you cannot break through, right now just lift up a hand, right now. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you give us revelation of the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And we bind every single lie of the enemy now in 
Jesus' name, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, that we, Romans says, we can be free from slavery to sin and become slaves of righteousness. So right now, we exchange we exchange our sin and pick up your garments of righteousness. The blood of Jesus covers every single sin. And so we plead the blood of Jesus right now over our hearts, over our minds. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that you are alive, the resurrected one, God who is with us, who is competently ruling and reigning across the earth. Jesus, we thank you that you are alive. You are not a dead God. We thank you, Jesus. I just anoint this man right now for the marketplace. And we just right now ask for favor, for favor, unreasonable favor. The Lord says that he gives you permission to ask him for unreasonable favor because he knows your heart is to steward things well. And so all fear of success, I break off of you now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, give this man a vision give him revelation, give him blueprints and strategies for multiplication now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, that you are good. You are a good father. You are a good father. Reveal right now the Father's love right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. There's nothing you can do to earn his affection. He says, I am well pleased with you. Come home. I am well pleased with you. Come home to me and find your inheritance in me. Find your inheritance in me. Is Shane in the room? Shane? Oh, he's there. Caleb or Kurt? Angel, can you come here? Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Can you just lay hands on him right now? Holy Spirit, give him revelation right now. Revelation of the Father's love for him. Thank you, Jesus. More, Lord God. Right now, can everyone just stretch out a hand and say, more, God. More, Jesus. Thank you, God. Increase right now. Increase the revelation of the Father's love. Thank you, God. There is nothing you can do to earn his affection towards you. Receive his love now. Receive his love now. Thank you, Jesus. Craig, can you come lay hands on him? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Shakira Babasaku. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are you guys married? Okay, so can you guys just hold hands for a second? I heard the Lord say that in a desolate place, he has called you to be pioneers. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you have called them to be the tip of the spear. And where people have not understood the assignment on their lives, that you have sent them like flint to separate bone from marrow. And I thank you that they will be advocates of the truth in Jesus' name. So I release right now by the power of God the prophetic anointing on these two. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have anointed them to be messengers of your truth through power and love, through power and love. There is a power and love anointing over your lives. I just keep seeing this banner over the two of you and it says, power and love, power and love, power and love. So Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you that you have anointed them and no prophetic word over their life will fall to the ground. But Holy Spirit, we ask right now that you make a way where there is no way. You make a way where there is no way, God. And so I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are doing something special in them and through them, God. And so, Holy Spirit, right now, we ask that all attacks from the enemy cease fire now in Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit. 
send angels, armies to protect them and surround them in every single place that they've been stolen from. We command right now by the blood of Jesus a return in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, God. Thank you that they are blessed and highly favored, God. So release them. Release them. I see you guys like a racehorse. And there's a, the, that moment and you're just waiting. You're waiting. You're waiting. And I just see in the spirit that the door is opening for you to thrust and run the race set before you. So come, Holy Spirit. And do only what you can do, God. I thank you that you have anointed them in power and love. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I just, I keep seeing these racehorses. And I just feel like it's, there's something connected to that with what you guys are called to do. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would give them vision and give them revelation. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. I pray that you would increase the prophetic anointing on their life, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord God. Increase, increase, increase. We lay it down our expectations and we receive your anointing Lord God we thank you Lord Jesus we thank you Lord Jesus for this couple Lord God every lying word from the enemy we cast down now in Jesus name thank you Jesus thank you Jesus and I just keep hearing the Lord say that you're a worshiper I just sing, you sing in your house, and I, I just hear these cries out to the Father, and I just see the Lord just writing down the words that come off your heart. So Holy Spirit, release this worship anointing over him, Lord God. And Holy Spirit, I just ask right now that you would put hot coals on his lips. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So if you have children in the kids program, can you go ahead and get your children? If you feel led to go get baptized, go get baptized. If you see a need in this room, just go and pray for someone right now. But I wanna encourage you as you go into your daily life lift up your eyes they're not going to come to you you need to go to them jesus we thank you for the holy spirit we'll see all of you tonight at five o'clock on the farm for prayer if you've never experienced the power of god come to kingsley farms 471 pinckney road in Bergal. And then we'll see you there again this Friday for the best, best, best Good Friday. So we'll see you guys tonight and we'll see you guys on Friday.